Before we start, do subscribe and hit a like button. It really helps with the algorithm. And also, do write in the comments where you're from. Thank you. And now. Story time. My buddy was camping in Northern Ontario about a decade ago. It was him and one other guy. Everything was going great. They caught a bunch of fish and fried some up for dinner. They hung up the rest of the catch in the trees for the evening. The sun was down and they were relaxing. As they sat by the fire they heard sounds coming from the bush. There were normal animal sounds, leaves crunching, twigs snapping. Easily a squirrel or raccoon. But there were also strange laughing sounds. My buddy looks in his periphery and sees what he describes as a little spider man. His camping partner sees the same thing, a little, human-like figure. Like a hunched dwarf. They get spooked and run a few meters from camp. When they return, all the fish is gone from the trees. In only a matter of a few minutes. This, by itself, is not that scary. It could have been raccoon, porcupine, whatever. The eyes play tricks, and my buddy is a scientist so he is not easily swayed by extraordinary explanations. Fast forward to me in the Ontario archives doing research for my dissertation. I came across an interview with early 20th century explorer Ernest Oberholzer. He recounts stories from his indigenous travel companion and guide Atuk Kaumau and Tatapaswer Betten or Billy McGee who said the Anishinaabeg people north of Lake Superior spoke of Mishifasu or Mama Gray Sea, which were little people or dwarves who made strange sounds and played tricks on people. Same area my buddy was camping, similar descriptions. I immediately messaged my buddy. If anything a fun story, but creepy if we let our imaginations run wild. My boyfriend and I went camping with two other couples. I took them to a favorite spot of mine about three hours out of town, and definitely deep into the forest. I had been going to it for years with my family, but our friends were more used to by the lake camping and are more city folk. I know the kind of people who are out there, like off-grid hippies and mostly tweakers, there's a known rumor of the meth labs out there, and I know to keep my mouth shut. Our friends, however, did not. So anyway, we had just eaten dinner, and we were all sitting by the campfire drinking when we suddenly heard someone yelling Marcus very loudly. It was a woman's voice, and she was obviously in distress, but the thing was, she was coming from the east, which is the opposite direction anyone would be coming from, except for those tweakers. I instantly fell silent, not wanting to draw attention to our little group, but one of our friends yelled back, Poyo, thinking the woman had yelled Marco and thought it would be funny. Well, the woman heard our friend and proceeded to yell through the very dark night, asking us how to get to our camp. I told everyone to be quiet, hoping she would move along, but that's when she saw the fire. She continued to yell obscenities as she made her way towards us. At one point, she clearly fell down the hill we were below because we could hear a crash and some would crackle which she also blamed on us because we were shining a very bright light at her and she couldn't see. The only light out there was the fire, and we still couldn't see her because of it. She was definitely tripping balls, which made me more anxious because you never know what someone like that will do. So after about 10 minutes of her trampling through the forest and falling down a few times, she finally started to walk into view. This was when the rest of my friends had that oh shit moment. She was clearly a meth head and in very bad shape, and she wanted to stay to eat and sleep in our camp. She insisted to the point of plopping her ass down on the ground next to us and refusing to leave. She had never once asked us to help her or if she could even come into our camp, and she was very rude. I would have been happy to help her, but she was high and very twitchy and pretty much demanded things from us that we weren't going to give. So my boyfriend, a very bulky and quite scary dude when you make him mad, finally stood up, grabbed her a water bottle, and told her she had to leave, and now. She whined some more in a very childish manner and yelled at us that we weren't God's children. But he forced her to get up, and she turned towards the way she came. 
She continued to yell into the night about how rude and unkind we were, nicer equivalents to what she said. At one point, she dropped the water bottle we gave her, and she blamed us for that too. We could slowly hear her yelling becoming farther and farther away. But what scared me the most was her coming back later, she already knew where we were. Let's just say none of us slept that night. And I hope to God my friends learn their lessons. You don't mess around in the forests. There are people out there that know it better than you. That's not the first time I've come into contact with unwanted people. Took the wife and two dogs camping with me one time in North Georgia. After a full day of driving, setting up and drinking that night if was bedtime. Sometime in the middle of the night something was really close to my side of the tent pressing up against it. I woke up to it hitting my head but my dogs never alerted which was strange because one being a basset always alerts when a rabbit or something is the yard and the other was a Heinz's 57 puppy who was always curious. I froze as I could what looked like a man's hand pressing on the wall coming right down on my head. Not knowing what to do and not really wanting to use the Glock I pressed back and as soon as I did whatever it was took off. I layer there panicked for a while thinking it was a bear looking for some food or a creeper from the next clearing over. When the sun came up I crawled out to find nothing had been touched and couldn't find any tracks where they would have been at my side of the tent. Didn't tell my wife about it for a few days after the trip was over. That was my only bad experience so far from camping and I've been a great number of times up in those hills. A few summers ago, me and a few buddies went catfishing at a local reservoir. This is rural Ohio, and the reservoir was off a dirt road about 2 miles from the village it fed, which was a village of about 1,500 people. We had fished this spot tons of times, and we very rarely saw other people during the day, and we never saw anyone out there at night. So the day we went out, it was about 9 p.m., sun's going down, we had a couple cases of beer, we were planning on staying out until the sun came back up. We didn't want to be bothered, we weren't really allowed to have alcohol around the reservoir anyway, so we actually drove a dirt service road clear around the reservoir as far away as we could get from the road in. This service road was nothing but compacted dirt, with tree roots running across it, areas that had washed away during flooding, fallen trees in the road that had been there for years, etc. This was not a well-traveled road, and the only way we got around it was that we all had lifted 4x4 four four trucks or jeeps. The site we pick is out on a piece of land that stretches out into the water a bit in a teardrop kind of shape, goes maybe 20 feet out into the reservoir. So we have water on all sides of us besides our back. We figure we can fish from different directions, since we will have five or six poles in the water, it would give us a little more room to cast without tangling lines. Plus, there was remnants of a fire pit, and some with that was already collected. So we get start a fire, bait our poles and start drinking. We fish for two or three hours and get good and drunk. In the meantime, a thick summer fog creeps in across the pond. Then, we hear a huge curse sploosh and we see the ripples coming from across the water to our right. There is maybe 50 yards of water between us and the other bank, and the fog was so thick we could not see the bank or what caused the sound, but we could see the ripples in the water once they got to us. We explain it away to a tree limb falling in the water, or maybe a beaver jumping off the bank, do beavers jump? and we keep fishing. About 20 minutes later, another huge curse bloosh. And the ripples come again. And let me tell you, there was no mistaking the sound. It was not a fish flopping, and it was not a frog jumping in the water, it was the sound of a large heavy object. Like, the sound someone makes when they do a cannonball off the diving board. But, we explain it away as we did with the first. Shortly after that, we run out of wood for the fire. So we leave one guy to watch the poles, me and a few buddies go out into the brush to find fallen sticks and whatnot. We all go our separate ways, and meet back at the fire shortly after. One of my buddies comes back to the fire with a white jacket, a pair of rubber boots, and a clown mask in his arms. 
This was about the time when there were all the posts about the scary clowns who would lurk around towns to scare people. I knew those stories were bullshit so I figured it was just left over from dumbass kids who had a party out there one night and left it. So we get the fire going again, we fish for a little while longer, when we hear twigs breaking in the woods across the water and then another huge curse bloosh. At this point, we know there is someone out there with us, and the sound has to be someone dropping something in the water. So we call out, like, hey if there is someone out there, we aren't making trouble, just fishing and drinking some beers. We'd be happy to have you join us. Dead silence. So we call out again and again, to no response. A couple of my buddies are seriously freaking out at this point between the booze, the clown mask, the fog and the mystery noises. So I get that drunk courage. You know the kind, and I decide we should all go walk around the bend and see just what the fs going on. This guy's being AA. Hole and trying to scare us. I convince two of my buddies to come with me, and the other two guys watch the poles. So we three trek into the brush with our flashlights, make our way through the thick as fog, start working around this lake, and as we go, we start finding bits of trash, and saplings that have been cut down, and then more trash, and then footprints, of someone in their bare feet. Which is odd, since it was so much work to get back to this spot on the lake. No one would be hiking around this far around the lake to fish in this spot. As I'm sweeping the woods with my flashlight, I walk over the crest of a hill, and not 10 feet in front of my face is a tent. This tent had been here for a long time. There was moss growing on the sides of it, and there was trash and shit thrown all around this campsite. Most concerning though, was the pile of propane tanks. There had to have been 15 or 20 of those 5 gallon propane tanks. So, we all looked at each other, and I said Valp. I guess this is none of my business. And we hurriedly made our way back to the fire, threw all of our shit in the back of the trucks and made our way out of there in a hurry. On the way out from around the reservoir, we pull onto the main, still dirt, road and pass a shitty little Toyota Camry with five dude in it. Watching in the rear view, they pull onto the service road we just left out of. So, for those that aren't savvy to rural southern Ohio, we busted a meth lab in the middle of the woods. The owner of said meth lab tried to scare us away by throwing shit in the lake. I can only assume that when throwing shit in the lake didn't scare us away, the meth cook called some of his buddies to scare us out, or worse yet, the meth cook called his buddies after we saw his operation, in which case, I'm glad we got out of there before they showed up. I was camping with my girlfriend, at the time, and her sister and sister's boyfriend. We made steak and beans for dinner, and after sleeping until around midnight, yours truly got the bubble guts. So I figured I would hoof it to the outhouses and all would be well. Boy, was I wrong for assuming that taking a dump would be in my cards. A pack of trash pandas was blocking the path, and as soon as I got close enough to see what they were, I heard a chorus of growls. I damn near shit my pants, but I made it back to camp and waited it out until morning. I was approached from behind at 5.30 am still dark. About to board the boat to go across the lake to get my truck when I heard a grunt. I thought it was a bear, so I slowly turned. Keep in mind, this is Buckhorn Lake State Park, in Nesita, Wisconsin, and the cabin I was in was a rental across from my step-uncle's property. He always said there were monkeys in the forest behind the cabins. Anyway, I slowly turned and this thing I noticed with glowing yellow eyes, then the rest. It was a female. The skin was grayish yellow and she wore fur around her ankles and wrists. The breasts were hairless and she was around 6 foot 7 inches and looked to be looked to weigh 250 pounds, sort of skinny for as tall as she was. She had markings on her body. She had no clothing on her body anywhere. She had some hair but not what everyone says a Bigfoot has. Well, my stepdad came to the door and saw her with a spear and he had a rifle leaning against the door facing, and he shot in front of her. 
She slowly turned her head and had a look like bring it when all at once the bushes behind me rattled and I turned, like, now what? Here's Xena, princess warrior from hell. Now what? As I turned to look, the female jumped and I'm talking 12 feet up and 25 feet out and she disappeared in midair, but as she jumped, there was the silver sparkly thing that started flashing like fireflies, but they were silverish white looking. I finally got my sidearm, a 9mm short nose with a sight out and my head started ringing and whatever was in the bush was gone. I grew up in the middle of nowhere. We used go camping all the time with different groups of friends. We had tons of different lakes and places to go. One night, there were four of us, two guys, two girls, all around 19 years old, two tents. Where we were, we have been lots of times before as it's a great spot by a lake. That night, just before dark, we all decided to go fishing about a minute or two walk from our campsite. We were gone for about an hour, came back and our campsite was completely gone. Everything, tent, coolers, our stuff, everything but what we took fishing with us. There is no possible way a person could have taken it, as where we were, Therese only one way in and out and we were fishing in the entrance. We were about a 10 minute canoe ride back to our vehicles with the spotlights that were still in them and thank god I still had my keys in my pocket as it had a bottle opener on it lol. We went back the next day and there was not a sign of any of our stuff, like nothing at all. What's crazy is there was a 40 foot cliff straight behind us and the actual place we were camping was about 300 feet by 300 feet with rocks on both sides. It freaks me out thinking about it to this day what could have possible happened to all of it. I would like to tell you about a couple of unusual things that I have encountered. First off I will tell you I grew up on a small farm and am an avid outdoorsman. My family are hunters and I am familiar with all the local wildlife. I have lived in the area called the Ridge all my life. I'm 43. I am working on becoming a 35er in the Catskills and have done 17 peaks so far. I call the woods my home. My first story happened when I was in my mid-twenties. I would take my family camping on vacation in the Catskills in Livingston Manor. On this particular day, I was taking my son fishing to a pond I had found way in the woods. It was about a two-mile walk up an old logging road that was made at the turn of the century. There was a pond at the top of a series of waterfalls that had an old dam built to control water flow for the old railroad that long had been removed. There was a summer cottage on the pond that I and my son walked to and around to ask for permission to fish. No one was there and it looked like no one had been in a very long time. So I decided to fish from the dam at the edge of the property. We were there all afternoon and fishing was good. It was getting pretty dark when we started hearing noises in the woods across the pond in the direction of the cottage. They sounded like footsteps, heavy ones. They would go and stop sometimes fast and sometimes like they were creeping along. I thought that maybe the cottage owner was coming to chase us out of there so I shouted hello, who's there? But got no response. Then there was more noise from the other side now. There was more than one. Now I'm thinking bear? Coyotes? I yelled again and as I did a rock hit the ground 20 feet from me. Now I know bears don't throw rocks. Was someone messing with us? Just as I thought that another rock, a big rock, hit the water. Now I know when I'm not wanted and quickly gathered my things and my son. I yelled out all right we're leaving and got the heck out of there. I could hear the footsteps continuing around in our direction around the pond as we headed out. Whatever it was it stopped when we got 100 yards down the trail. What or who was in the woods back then I still don't know. We were miles from the nearest road and no one ever answered. Whatever it was didn't want us there. My next story took place when I was hiking with my sister up Wittenberg Mountain on our way to Cornell Mountain. We had made it to the summit of both Wittenberg and Cornell in about two and a half hours and were on our way back. We made good time up and the trail was clearly marked. I had GPS just in case and recorded my hikes as I went so I could look at average pace, elevation gain, 
etc. We had seen others on the trail too. Now I can't explain it but it took us a long time to get down. A really long time. We kept hiking and following the trail for hours but it just kept going. Both me and my sister couldn't understand it but what took us two and a half hours up took six and a half to get back. It was like we were stuck in a time loop. We checked the GPS and maps and followed trail marks but it seemed like we weren't getting anywhere. We would comment to each other how long it was taking and what was going on. The GPS kept saying a little farther. By the time we made it out, it had been 10 hours. Time warp? Are fey folk messing with us? Can't say. The GPS showed our average pace on the way back was the same as the ascent and the mileage didn't add up to the time. Just weird. I really think something was going on. My last story happened when I was on my way home from work. I have about a 40 minute drive to work on route 44 or 55 which takes me over the ridge and to the local town of Newburgh on the Hudson River. On my way home I was approaching the ridge where 1200 foot cliffs rise above the Hudson Valley. It was a swamp on both sides of the road. It was dark out and a clear nice night. Up ahead about 60 feet I saw a figure come out and cross the road. I was traveling about 55 miles an hour. It was a shadow person. My headlights could not light it up even though it was right in front of me. The figure was tall walking on two legs, if I had to guess taller than 6 feet. My headlights would illuminate the road everything around it even the sign past it. But not he figures. It absorbed the light and was just dark. You couldn't see through it but it was definitely there and turned toward me a little as it crossed from right to left. I slowed when I reached the spot where I saw it but there was nothing there. It was a swamp on both sides that was sparsely wooded. If something was there it would have nowhere to hide. I firmly believe I saw a shadow person cross in front of me. Something that walks on two legs and is the size of a big human. I have never seen anything there again. This wasn't camping but at a summer camp. Had someone on multiple occasions peep into a specific cabin counselor's room at around 3 to 4 am it happened about 4 times. On one occasion someone had flashed a light into her room and she ran out and woke me up. I've never been so scared in my life as being awake at 4 am in the pitch black in the middle of the woods. Looking for someone who could be watching me that very moment. After three weeks of this happening someone wrote kill yourself on her car and the incident stopped. Still have no idea who it was. Waking up at midnight to the sound of thunder only to check my phone and see that we are under a severe thunderstorm warning with quarter sized hail and 60 plus miles per hour gusts and to seek shelter immediately. Both of my kids were with me and there wasn't anywhere for us to find shelter. The first gust literally ripped half the tent stakes out of the ground with all three of us inside. I had to do everything I could to hold the tent down and keep the kids calm while we endured approximately 45 minutes of the worst thunderstorm I've ever been in. It was one of the few times I was legitimately afraid for my life. Do not F with weather. I live in the woods. Back in the 50s, the state had been buying land from farmers. One farmer refused to sell all his land to the state and instead sold parcels along a seasonal road to private entities. In the 1970s, my father purchased a 38-acre parcel from the farmer and built a home. Years later, my parents would buy out another neighbor's home and raise it. Surrounding our now 50-acre parcel is a 900-plus acre state-owned forest, and surrounding that is another 3,000 acres of national forest. I wanted to paint a picture for when I say I live in the woods, I mean I live in the woods. Bobcats, deer, bears, mountain lions, packs of 15 to 40 coyotes, koi dogs, and even a badger once in a while have I seen while out in my backyard. Now for the strange. I have been witness to a great many events that defy all reason. Once, while in my living room hanging around with friends, a steel water bottle, one of those ones with the twist-off caps, about a liter, 
jumped two feet straight up off the table and came back down landing in the same ring of condensation it flew up from. We all left the room. Again, with some friends over playing video games in the living room, we are all chatting and the game is loud. An awkward pause as the loading screen music stops suddenly. The game froze. We all fell silent. Behind us, coming from the kitchen, I hear the sink's faucet is on, full bore. No one had been in that part of the house. In fact, you don't have to even go by the kitchen to get to the living room, and due to the wider doorway from the non-kitchen side, most people don't even know that it's back there when they walk through. There's a light fixture in the bathroom that no matter how many times I rewire or fix or replace the fixture, one bulb will always not light up. Three bulb fixture? The middle one not lighting. Two bulb fixture? The left one will never light up. I've even run separate circuits from two different ends of the house, two breaker boxes, and still, any computer, TV, or stereo will randomly switch on or off on their own regardless of switch type or power source. This only happens when you are not in direct line of sight to the device. Remote controls with batteries out of them and even sometimes unplugged devices getting split-second moments of power. Some more surroundings. The house is about 200 feet below the peak of the ridgeline of the mountain. The driveway extends east up the hill. We are on the western face. Below us to the NW or W or SW is the majority of the forest. There are state-run hiking trails that actually cross our property due to poor mapping on the state's part. Within a two-mile hike in three directions, there are hundreds of unmarked graves, old foundations of shine shacks, and smugglers' dens. There are stone staircases in the sides of hills that lead nowhere and come from nothing. I have never for a moment felt threatened or endangered but I have felt that I was not alone, even if I was. I have hiking stories as well as more creepy supernatural stuff around the house. I'll be happy to share more if there are interested parties. In January 1965, a group of musicians, including Jimi Hendrix, driving back to Manhattan, were stranded in a blizzard and had gotten stuck in a heavy drift that reached the hood of their vehicle. They were on a rural road in central New Jersey. It was bitter cold. Unexpectedly, the road ahead of them suddenly lit up, as a bright phosphorescent object, cone-shaped, like a capsule, landed in the snow about 100 feet up ahead. It stood on a tripod landing gear. Before any of the stunned occupants of the vehicle could move, a door opened on the side of the craft and an entity stepped out. He stood eight feet tall, his skin was yellowish, and instead of eyes, the creature had slits. His forehead came to a point, and his head ran straight to his chest, leaving the impression that he had no neck. The being proceeded to float to the ground and glided towards the trapped occupants of the van. The snow melted in the wake of the creature. His body seemed to generate tremendous heat so much so that as it came across a small rise, the snow disappeared around in all directions. In a matter of what seemed like seconds, the being came over to the right-hand side of the van, where Hendrix sat, and looked right through the window. According to other witnesses at the scene, the creature seemed to be communicating telepathically with Hendrix. Immediately the interior of their vehicle began to heat up. The heat coming from the being evaporated the snow enough to free their imprisoned van. The being glided behind the van and the snowdrift by now had completely vanished. Turning the ignition, the driver gunned the engine and drove away at high speed. As they looked back, they could see the road filling in with snow again. The object was at the same instant lifting off like a rocket from a launching pad. boyfriend and I planned a five-day trip in Southern California. We had met each other while through hiking the Appalachian Trail, so we both had plenty of experience. We went to Whole Foods to buy our food for this trip and indulged. For such a short trip, we weren't worried our packs would be too heavy. We wanted to eat nice food. So the second day we hiked to a site that was perhaps 30 meters from a dirt service road. 
By the road there was a large trough to feed horses. We decided to put our food bags under that, as it was large and heavy, and already overturned. This would keep us safe from bears, and our food safe from animals. We woke up in the morning to go get our food and half of it was gone. I mean, from the two food bags, someone had picked out select foods and taken them. This was not an animal, it was a human. The thing that creeped me out was wondering if this other person had seen us come and place the food there, all while we were thinking we were alone. We were miles from the nearest town, so even though there was a service road it's not like we were near any civilization. We turned around and went back, as we no longer had enough food for our trip. I grew up down a long dirt road in rural Alabama. My family owns a decent amount of land. I still miss the peacefulness sometimes, but I'm a gamer so I need my high-speed internet. Anyway, the first time my friend and I decided to camp by ourselves, we were about 12 years old, we picked a spot in a field that was right at the edge of the woods. We really weren't that far from the house. Maybe 500 to 600 yards. Far enough to make us feel like we were being brave but close enough to haul us back to the house if needed. Everything was going fine. We had a tiny fire and plenty of junk food to gorge ourselves with. It was probably around 10 or 11 that things took a turn for the worse. We were both just sitting and staring at the flames. There wasn't much noise that night because it was early winter and the bugs had pretty much vacated by that time. So all we heard was the crackling of the fire and the occasional wind gust blowing what few dead leaves might have remained on the trees. That's when we heard it. I couldn't say exactly how far away the sound was, but it came from the woods. It was a blood-curdling scream. To this day I've never heard anything in the wild that would make you as uneasy as that sound. We both looked at each other, and I know that we were thinking run to the house. But we were tough kids right? So we decided we'd lock ourselves in our tent and brave this new danger we'd discovered. Neither of us had any clue what that noise was, but we knew we weren't setting a foot outside the tent until the sun came up. My friend ended up actually falling asleep an hour or so later. I didn't have an easy time though. I could see the dying light of the fire glimmering through the tent fabric. I just laid there watching the light dance until something disturbed it. It was like the fire went out completely but then it came back and I immediately realized something had walked between the fire and the tent. I covered my head with my sleeping back. Scared to death. I never heard a sound. No footsteps. Nothing ever messed with the food we left outside. 30 minutes later, I had to uncover my head because I was pouring sweat and about to suffocate myself. I could still see a tiny glow from what was left of the fire. I couldn't see or hear anything else. I laid there for probably another hour before I finally fell asleep. I woke to sunlight. My friend was already up and outside. We talked about the scream and I told him what I'd seen after he fell asleep. We looked around and could see no tracks or any other signs that something else had been here besides us. I went on a camping retreat with a group of friends when I was just out of high school. We stayed at a campground that was made up of lots of cabins that had those metal bunk beds and a large main cabin with a kitchen and socializing area. It was the first night up there, and I wanted to take a walk around the wood near the campgrounds. I walked along some trails until I could no longer see the lights from the cabins and it was practically pitch black. After a little while, my night vision kicked in and I continued my exploratory hike. After about 15 minutes of walking in the dark, I could see a shape ahead of me in the path. I stopped and tried to make out what was there. About 100 feet ahead of me was some small guy or kid standing in the middle of the path. He was standing completely still, and it appeared he was standing in the middle of a bridge that the path led to. I stayed really quiet and started backing away while keeping my eye on him. It was way too dark for me to make out any details about him from where I was, all I could really see was that he was standing completely still. My nerve finally broke and I hurried back to the campground. When I got back, I told my friends about what I just saw, and of course, 
A bunch of them wanted to head out to check out what I found. So, a bunch of us group up and I lead them back to the bridge where I saw the guy standing. As we got closer to the spot, I could see that he was still standing in the same spot. We all kind of stopped and waited, we started whispering to one another about what we should do now. Some wanted to turn back around, and others want me to go over to him to see if he was okay. Being stupid, I agreed. I went ahead of the group and inched my way towards the figure. I was ready to bolt the moment something seemed wrong. So I got close and when I got to the head of the bridge I could see what the shape actually was. It was an upright vacuum. Someone had stuck an upright vacuum in the middle of a hiking path for some reason. I guess seeing something so foreign to the surroundings along with it being complete black and white dark made our imaginations go a bit wonky. Overall, this was pretty mundane, but the whole experience has stuck with me now for decades. My friends and I used to go to the local park to swim in the creek late at night. The park was pretty heavily wooded with lots of hiking trails, and the creek was in one of these wooded areas. We set out for the park around midnight, it was a clear night and the moon was full, this will be relevant later. As soon as we arrived things felt, off and we were all on edge, but we wouldn't voice that until later. As my friends Daniel, Aiden and I entered the woods things only felt more off. It was oddly quiet, normally there was the sound of insects, frogs, and other nighttime critters. But that night it was completely silent. It was also dark, abnormally dark. Yeah, it was past midnight but like I'd said it was a clear night with a full moon. I'd been there many times, and had never struggled to see. When we arrived at the creek Aiden hopped right in and Daniel and I stayed along the bank. My guard was up at this point, and I didn't want to be in the water. Not long after this is when things started getting weird. We all froze as there was a loud groaning sound, it's hard to describe. It was like metallic grinding that came from the sky. I suggested that maybe it was just a car crash or a train, then joined A in the water, but stayed where it was shallow. Then we heard the sound a second time, but louder and more spread out to where it no longer came from any discernible direction. I hopped out of the water at this point and Daniel and I began questioning if we should leave, while Aiden insisted we should stay. Well, then we heard it a third time, louder again and it was as if the earth was groaning. At that point Aiden flew out of the water and we all ran back to the car. It was like the get the F out instinct hit us all at once. As we all stood in the parking lot drying off I spotted a figure in the creek at the edge of the tree line. It was solid white and humanoid, it didn't have a face but darkened areas where facial features would be. It was pipedal but its movements were jerky and unnatural. It was too tall to be an owl, too small to be an adult human. It actually looked a lot like the Fresno crawler, I don't think it was that, emo that video is fake. But that is the closest visual I can give. I pointed a finger to the figure and asked my friends if they saw it, they did and right as we all looked at it it froze and looked back at us. Without a word we all piled into the car, and Don Yal whipped the car around illuminating the tree light, but the figure was gone. On the drive back we all talked about how we'd all felt on edge as soon as we'd arrived and how we all thought it was too dark or quiet. Back at our dorm we went out for a smoke to ease our nerves and spotted a helicopter headed towards the park, it wasn't the usual hospital or police helicopter. It seemed to be military. Coincidence? Probably, but in the moment it didn't help our nerves. I know why sailors are superstitious. I used to not understand what that old cliché was about. Now I do. The yacht belonged to my friend, David. He made good money in finance over the last few years. Not exactly a fortune, but a decent amount. Enough money to buy a yacht decent. It was a nice boat, big enough for multiple people to sleep on but small enough to be operated by a single person. After some subtle hinting, he invited me for a trip out on the water, somewhere quiet, he said, where not a lot of other ships went. No competition for fish, he said. You'll like it. 
I wasn't actually interested in fishing. I just wanted a trip on a yacht. On the first evening of our voyage, David went downstairs to prepare the fish he had caught, leaving me at the controls on the bridge, or whatever it's called. The sun was sinking into the ocean, and I was starting to feel just a bit nervous about spending my first night at sea. The water was calm and strangely soothing in the daylight, but as night fell I started to wonder how deep it was. While I was sitting there, thinking about the increasingly inky depths below my feet, the radio crackled. I looked down at it, startled, I hadn't even noticed it was there. I was wondering whether to call for David when a strange, distorted woman's voice came from the speaker. Attention! The RV sunrise has not returned to port. Attention! No sighting in the first perimeter. Attention! My reaction, deer in headlights. Was this a distress signal? Was I supposed to say something? Were we going to have to go rescue the crew of a sinking ship? Hello? I said cautiously, leaning down to what I thought was a microphone. Attention! Terminal depth is increasing rapidly. Attention! Sonar has detected movement within the perimeter. The RV sunrise has not returned to port. Attention! Like I said, I don't know much about ships, but this didn't sound like a normal distress call to me. I couldn't figure out whether it was an actual person speaking, or a recorded message. David suddenly came flying up the steps and switched the radio off, looking extremely flustered. I asked him whether that was a good idea, what if someone was in trouble? But he just muttered that it was fine, and not to worry about it. I asked him what the message had been about, but he dodged the question and told me that the fish was ready. He didn't speak much during dinner, and he kept glancing out at the black water. It was a cloudy night, and you couldn't even see the waves beyond the yacht's lights. I got the feeling that David wanted to turn around and sail home, but I guess he didn't want to disappoint me by cutting the trip short. Or maybe he was just reluctant to sail in the dark. We went to bed in the yacht's narrow bunks with a feeling of unease. A noise woke me up some time during the night. I lay there for a second, disoriented. Then I heard it again, a crackle of static, coming from above, where the bridge was. I looked across at David's bunk. He was fast asleep. A light on the radio was blinking, and there were muffled, crackling noises coming over the line, as though someone was transmitting dead air. I looked over my shoulder to make sure David was still downstairs, then leaned down and said cautiously, Hello? A man's voice answered immediately. This is the RV sunrise, transmitting from out beyond the, uh. There was a pause, like the speaker was checking something. I think we're well past the fourth perimeter, maybe even into the fifth, if you can believe it, control. The voice was garbled and heavily distorted, I had a lot of trouble making out what it was saying. I had no idea how to reply to this. This is the Aurora, it's a yacht. Do you need help? Are you in trouble? I think that's what I said. Control, you've got a real situation brewing out here, our sonar is going crazy with movement. Seems like at least a dozen signatures below us, all the way down to terminal depth and they're big. You've got to contain this. I obviously had no idea what any of this meant. Sorry, this isn't, uh, control. This is just a yacht, the Aurora. Do you need help? Do you want us to call? That's a proximity warning, I think we're in trouble. We will keep transmitting as long as we're able. Sunrise out for now. I realized that the man couldn't hear me. Either that, or this was a pre-recorded message, like with the earlier transmission, I couldn't tell. I just stared at the radio after it went silent, perplexed. What was all this about perimeters and sonar? Then the radio emitted an ear-splitting, electronic shriek. I yelled in surprise and fell over backwards. A few seconds later David came running up the stairs, disheveled and slightly panicked. What's wrong? He said. I heard you yelling, what happened? I pointed to the radio. As if on cue, the robotic woman's voice came back, the RV sunrise has not returned to port. Attention! No sightings in the first perimeter. This seemed to shock David to his core. 
he actually held onto the back of the chair for support, as though his knees were about to buckle. As you can imagine, at this point I was about ready for an explanation. Thankfully, I didn't have to force one out of him. He seemed deflated and weak, as though he had just suffered an enormous fright, and he told me what he knew. There was a reason why this part of the ocean was so deserted. Ships avoided it, because strange things were known to happen out here. Mysterious lights, phantom vessels that vanished as abruptly as they appeared, and odd, eerie radio broadcasts whose source no one could ever locate. The fishing is really good out here, he said, leaning hunched against the wall and rocking back and forth slightly. But this place, isn't normal. Ships go missing sometimes. Or they come back after weeks, but the crew think they've only been gone for a few days. Or people see things in the water. He clamped his mouth shut and was silent for a moment. He looked up at me guiltily. I mean, that's what the stories say. I've been out here a dozen times and nothing like that has ever happened before, I swear. David was always prone to panic, whereas I tend to be the pragmatic one. Well, nothing bad has happened yet. Those radio messages are creepy, but they're not hurting us. Let's just get out of here and go home. He clapped me on the shoulder, looking very serious. I shouldn't have brought you out here. I'll get us back safely, I promise. I didn't answer. I had just seen something over his shoulder, lights, flashing on the horizon, like ships signaling with Morse code. They flickered for a few seconds, then stopped. I decided not to tell him about it, he was rattled enough already, and he was the only one who could operate the ship. I waited downstairs while David got us underway, trying to keep my nerves under control. I could almost feel the dark, deep water below me. I told myself that when we got home, I was never setting foot on a ship again. And I tried to make sense of the strange radio messages. Were they a secret government operation? Some kind of experiment? A code? Or just a prank? The engine suddenly went quiet. The yacht came to a stop as quickly as a yacht can. Then David screamed. It was my turn to sprint up the stairs. I found him sagging against the wall, staring out the window in horror, and went to see what had scared him so badly. There was another ship outside, next to ours. Like, right next to it, so close that I'm still amazed we didn't hit it, looming out of the dark like deep sea creature. In case you never noticed, the ocean is very large, we had seen other ships when we were setting off, but always from a great distance. Finding this one so close was like waking up to a stranger standing next to your bed. It's not working, David said, fiddling desperately with the controls. Indicator lights flickered on and off. Something's wrong, nothing's working. It's that ship, it wants to keep us here. He was losing it. I calmed him down, and did the only thing I could think of. I volunteered to go onto the ship. I could literally reach out and touch the bow, that's how close it was to us, and I managed to rig up something with a rope that let me climb aboard. Why? Why did I decide to board a creepy, apparently abandoned ghost ship that somehow materialized out of thin air? Mainly because I was hoping there was someone on board who could help us. But I was also willing to consider that David was right, that the ship was somehow keeping us from leaving. The ship seemed to be dead in the water, the controls at the bridge were unresponsive, and all the lights were off, luckily, I thought to bring a torch. I stood on the deck, wondering what to do next, and heard a low electrical hum below my feet. Creeping along in the dark, narrow corridors of the interior was not a fun experience, as I'm sure you can imagine. My flashlight beam picked out clothes hanging up and personal objects left around. There was no sign of commotion or any sort of disturbance. When I called out into the darkness, no one replied. I did find the ship's name, stamped on a bulkhead, RV Sunrise. The hum was coming from the ship's engine room, where I found a massive array of complicated looking equipment that evidently had its own power source. I don't have the faintest idea what any of it did, but there was a large and prominent switch in the side of what looked like a control box, so I did what anyone would do in that situation. I turned it off. As soon as the loud hum stopped, I heard a whispering voice, 
coming from deeper in the engine room. I nearly had a heart attack, but it turned out to be a small radio, which I hadn't heard previously due to the sound the equipment was making. The voice coming from it was so quiet that I almost had to press my ear to the speaker to understand it. Everything is gone. The oceans are empty. There is no dry land anymore. Nothing is moving. The oceans are empty. We sail and sail, and there is no land. The oceans are empty. The sea floor has vanished. The oceans are empty. The oceans are empty. The oceans are empty. I got the hell out of there as fast as I could. And arrived at the ship's bow just in time to see the yacht depart at top speed. I stood there and watched it vanish into the distance, certain that this was some kind of hallucination, certain that I couldn't really be seeing what I was seeing. David was standing at the controls. I yelled his name until I was hoarse, but he never turned around. The lifeboats now seemed to be my only option. I didn't want to spend another second on that dark ship, with that eerie, whispering voice in its bowels, and I was willing to risk a voyage in an open lifeboat to get away. I probably would have swam, given the choice. I clambered into the nearest boat, then realized I had no idea how to lower it into the water, and that even if I could, I had no way of moving it on my own. Just as I was truly beginning to despair, something moved in the water below me. A burst of cold salt water sprayed over me, and there was a massive bang from the ship. Something attaching the lifeboat to the ship snapped, and it plunged down into the water, coming terrifyingly close to capsizing, flinging me against the side of the boat. When I picked myself up and looked around, the RV sunrise was already slipping beneath the waves. It wasn't sinking, it was being dragged under. I saw a vast, roiling shape below the water's surface, something with skin as pale as milk. The turbulence from the sunrise's descent pushed the lifeboat away, and I huddled in its center and watched as the ship vanished. It was over in less than a minute, and then I was alone. I drifted for seven hours before I was rescued. It was pitch black, so dark that I couldn't see where the lifeboat ended and the sea began. I listened to the water slapping against the boat's hull, waiting for something to grab me and drag me under, remembering the eerie voice I had heard on the sunrise, there is no dry land. We just sail and sail. The oceans are empty. I heard things while I was drifting in the dark. I heard the rhythmic splash of someone swimming next to my lifeboat. I heard a sudden burst of static, coming seemingly from the water itself, followed by a high-pitched, distorted voice, depth, 100 meters. Depth, 200 meters. Depth, 300 meters. Which slowly sank into the sea. I saw things, too. Things I won't describe. I huddled against the side of the boat, and ignored all of it. They were lures, put out by the ocean to trap me, just like the sunrise had been, the way anglerfish ensnare smaller prey. When morning came, I was spotted by another yacht. I discovered that I was nowhere near where we had set out, or anywhere I could have conceivably drifted. The crew, three middle-aged guys out on a fishing trip, asked me if I wanted to see a real good fishing spot nearby celebrate my rescue with a nice fresh caught meal. I told them to turn around and sail back to land immediately. They saw the look in my eyes, and did as I asked. David's yacht was found drifting, almost 200 miles from our approximate last location. There was no one on board and no clue as to what happened to him. After three days, the search and rescue operation was called off. They did find one thing on board. The local newspaper had a field day with it, calling it the modern Mary Celeste. Everything on the yacht was neat and tidy, except for two oddities. The radio had been smashed, and there was a single note written in a journal next to the ship's controls, by an unsteady hand. The RV Sunrise has not returned to port. My grandfather has a story that goes like this. Back in the 80s, he and his brother John were setting up to go fishing out in the boondocks. It was early morning, about 6.30 or so, and they were draining their coffee thermos on the bank of the pond. It was a new fishing spot for them to explore. At the time, 
They were living in East Texas, with humid breezes and mosquito bites that boiled in the heat. The sun was just beginning to break over the stretch of the trees as they pushed their rowboat into the water. My grandfather, we call him James, turned to John to remark on the brilliant yellow of the sunrise. It was blinding, he said. When he tells this story to our grandkids, he cannot stress this point enough. The sky was barely pink from the dawn, but the sun itself was shining like the quarter of an eclipse. John looked up, noticing the anomaly mere seconds before. James shielded his eyes and fumbled for the sunglasses clipped around his shirt collar. He started to tell John that they should leave, that he had a bad feeling about being there when the wind began to wail and the dirt picked up around them. John shouted to James, the words lost in the disturbed darkness. My grandfather tells us it was about this time he reckoned they should get going. He and John abandoned their poles and boat and scrambled to their truck. He figured they would be back for them later. Amid all the ruckus, John ran that poor Chevy C or K over a tree trunk, steering them into a tree a little off the trail. The truck was totaled. At the hospital, when the nurse asked how fast they were going, John offered 35, maybe 40 miles per hour. He had been pinned between the seat and steering wheel, sustaining a few bruised ribs but otherwise relatively unharmed. James had gone through the windshield. Victims of head-on collisions usually suffer crush injuries and severe internal trauma, including but not limited to lower body fractures, traumatic brain injuries, flail chest, abdominal, and upper body impact injuries. Even at low speeds, James' accident should have been fatal. However, my grandfather arrived at the hospital with minor cuts and bruises. He had a concussion the doctors wanted to keep an eye on, but other than that, both brothers were fine. Neither was able to say how long they were unconscious waiting for help to arrive because neither remembered anything after the accident or the next few days. They were, in short, miracles. Survivors of the impossible, or at least highly unlikely. My grandmother said the most alarming thing she experienced when visiting my grandfather in the hospital was his sudden ability to speak other languages. She said as she sat by his bedside table, he would switch tongues amid their conversation, then not remember a thing he had said. My sweet nan accused John and him of drinking. The doctors assured her that amnesia and a little confusion were common in trauma victims, especially ones who were unable to mentally process the events that had transpired. The accident had shaken their brains, that's all, a nurse told her. Nan insisted, though. You have to understand. My grandfather is a pure-blooded American redneck, a high school dropout. While he means well, he couldn't remember a lick of any foreign language while he was in school, let alone during his recovery. Nan investigated for herself. She cornered John in his rest bed. He wasn't any help. He had been unable to sleep, replaying the moment of the crash over and over again in his head until the memory stressed his conscience and he was admitted for psychiatric observation. Nan maintains to this day wasn't the sight of her husband stumbling over his sentences, bleeding from the stitches on his forehead. No, instead the memory that haunts her is John bolting upright every time he closes his eyes, screaming that it was too bright to see. My grandfather and John don't like to talk about what happened that day. They will talk about the pond, the sight of what they like to believe was a UFO, and the terror of realizing they were about to crash in the middle of the woods where no one was likely to find them. They won't talk about the experiences that came after, how they were found, or what happened between the moment of impact and their release from the hospital. What my grandfather will say, if prompted, is that he holds one proud scar from that crash. He'll point to the folds in his forehead that collapse around the raised skin, and he'll tell you, that's where they probed me. I'm from Australia. I'm 22 years old. The reason I decided to release this encounter is because I have done countless amounts of research on the internet trying to find what I think I saw when I think I was 9, pretty sure I was 9. I think I may have seen an alien. I thought it was a ghost or something but the more I think about it, the more it was likely to be an alien. 
So I was lying in my bed in this house which at the time was our holiday house but we're now living in it permanently. So I was lying in bed. My sister was lying on the other side of the bedroom, sleeping. I woke up in the middle of the night to a humming like him that kind of thing. I woke up and thought it was my sister and then I started feeling scared, like, I was just scared. I hadn't seen anything, I could just hear this humming and, I don't know, maybe it was 10 minutes of this. I was so hot and sweaty because I was so scared, I was paralyzed I couldn't move. I wanted to turn around to see if anybody was there. Anyway, after an amount of time, I got up whatever it was, the strength and, I don't know, the courage to turn around and I saw this thing standing at the end of my bed. I only looked at it so quickly that I turned my head back straight away and it was kind of like this hand-drawn sketch. This shape, this area, yeah, and it was brown. It was like going like this, looking around, seeing this, and turning around and falling back to sleep somehow. I can't remember what happened after that. Maybe waking up an hour later. There's nothing there. I ran to my sister's bed, like, I didn't even touch the ground, jumped into her bed, and slept in her bed for the rest of the night. It's what kids do. I woke up the next morning, told her and she freaked out. I hadn't seen anything like that since. So basically I had never seen anything like that before. Swear to God I definitely saw it. The main thing I looked for the next day was if there was a coat hanger on my door because I have always called it the hammerhead. Because you can see why and there wasn't like a jacket or anything hanging up on the wardrobe so it wasn't that. I mean, maybe it was my imagination, I don't know but whatever it was, it was there or not, it was there in my head. It was an image that my mind processed whether real or not, so if anybody else has seen this before, please come forward. It's going to confuse me for the rest of my life because I don't know whether I believe in that stuff. I guess there have been so many people who have had stories of seeing aliens, ghosts, there's been so many, to not believe that perhaps one percentage of that was real and if one percent is real then they exist and that's all you need. It's not possible that for every single one of those people who have claimed to have seen something unexplainable, it's impossible for that to not be real. I want to start this off by saying I am a very very skeptical person. I don't go searching to experience things, or looking for things. I also don't go around telling these stories, because they literally sound crazy. I still cannot comprehend it myself. But with having a burner account on Reddit, sometimes I want to get things off my chest. This might be deleted, soon. I have had very strange unexplainable encounters all my life. I want to tell whoever reads this, one experience that has stuck with me. It started with just random dreams when I was 17 years old. I would have odd dreams of this unknown man, whose physical appearance had great detail that is burned in my mind. I thought it was just my imagination, until it became repetitive and started to scare me. The dream would always be the same, he would abduct me take me to his place, and then just stare at me as if I was an alien. As if I was this strange thing, he had happened to come across. I ignored it, because they were just dreams. Then the dreams became extremely vivid. Then the dreams would start to turn into what felt like memories. Of this man, visiting me. A man with a strange very unique appearance. I do not know, nor have I ever seen him anywhere in my life. Never. One day, of recent. I had woken up to a man. I was in a very dazed sleep state. This man says something along the lines of, aren't you happy to see me? Me, being in this sleep state, I am confused but I can't fully wake up. I start to have a panic attack. He comes closer, and I realize this is the man I have had burned in my mind. And he kneels down by me, he is on a brown looking space suit with an orange bright patch on the left side from what I can remember. He seemed to notice I was panicking and he just kneels there with sympathy. That's the last thing I remember before I woke up with that memory. I spent the whole day afterward in fear. Fear. Pure fear. That is all I have to say for now. But it gives me anxiety even just typing this. Also, 
If I was an artist I would be able to easily draw him. I have never seen a man that looks like him. He doesn't even look human, at all. Edit, details about his appearance, large oval eyes, something is off about his eyes. Dark brown skin. Sometimes he is on a space suit. One very vivid dream he had on a black space suit with a black helmet. He has long braided hair, almost looks like locks. He is tall. Any more questions about his appearance ask. I will tell. So one night while walking home from a party because I lived in the area and also when you're a bit tipsy you need some of that night air. This particular night was a bit different because I noticed something following me. That's not even the best part of my story to be a bit more weird it was something in the sewer and manholes. Now I know what you're saying. You just told us you had a few before leaving your party. Absolutely, but that night was real as rain. I noticed I was being followed because I was at an intersection. What I thought was a cat in the sewer grate because of the glowing eyes wasn't. Mind you it's about 3 colon 14 3 30 am all bars, stores and places are basically closed. It's almost like a ghost town real heavy residential area little mom and pop shop slash general stores all the 24 hour stores like 7 Eleven and Wawa are all about 4 or 5 minutes away up the road. To figure out if I was truly crazy or not. While near my house I walked down a dead end street from the opposite way because a small park splits my street and the next street over. There also isn't a gutter on both sides of the dead end street because both are ran to a grate that turns into a culvert and cause a flooding. It's not directly linked into the system. So by the time I was able to get to my house which is only about 80 yards away. I then sit in my enclosed porch looking towards the other side this shaggy emaciated looking being slowly peeks in and out of the gutter almost crawling out at one point. I later found that some people call them groundlings or razorbacks they are 5 feet 7 inches to 6 feet 0 inches can weight up to 200 pounds shaggy, damp and matted hair. It grows down their backs like razorback hogs. This happened just now, I'm physically sick over this. I've had encounters with paranormal stuff in this house as an old post I made here detailed. That has since ended thanks to a local priest and a good sage smudging. It's currently 1.47 am here where I live. I got up to go to the bathroom and left the light off. For reference I haven't gone to sleep yet and I'm not really tired as I'm always up late. Every night when I go to the restroom I peer through the blinds and look in the backyard to see what's up and just be a little nosy. There is nothing but woods behind me for about 7 or 8 miles. I have no idea how to even describe what I saw. Pale skin, grayish, tall as all hell probably 7 feet. Exaggerated features, legs slim and super long, arms hung down past the knees. Kind of hunched over as well. I didn't get a super good look because it was walking back into the woods but this thing wasn't like any animal I know of. Here in Rhode Island our animals are pretty standard looking. Its movement was very rubbery like it moved without real motivation almost like it was in pain. I'm a skeptic but Jesus Christ that was one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen. What on earth was it? One day I decided I wanted to go shooting while visiting my uncle. He recommended to me some logging trails that go really deep into the woods where he used to go shooting as a kid. I decide I would go there and check them out and do some shooting. I decide to go to the gas station and fill up and while I'm filling up I notice this cool car, this will be important later, I see them leave and I leave a little after them. I find the road I want to take and turn off. I go about 10 miles as the crow flies up the various logging roads and find a nice spot with a backdrop to shoot into. I grab my gun, targets, and extra ammo and walk down the opening. As in walking I notice the wildlife gets quiet and I hear something whistle a certain pattern. I pause and listen to it. It whistles a different pattern this time. I whistle at it with a new pattern and it copies me. 
I do this a couple times seeing if it will copy me and it does. Until it whistles something different. I also heard walking in the bushes and it was close. I'm a little freaked out so I slapped my bolt release to load a round into my gun and walk back to my vehicle. I put my gun on the floor next to me and get out of there. As I'm going down the road I see the cool car I saw from the gas station. I stop and notice they are stopped and the guy on the passenger side is out of the car messing and struggling with something on the ground and the driver is staring at me, I said hi, and he just stared at me. I said have a good day and he just kind of mumbled and acted strange. They never saw my gun so I don't think that's why they were acting weird. So I left. About an hour goes by I find a different spot to shoot, did that for an hour, cleaned up and left. As I'm leaving I see them again. It was just an odd experience. I don't think they were the thing or person whistling at me in the woods. I saw them at a different place and time from when the whistling happened. I also don't think it was a bird, the whistling sounded like it was coming from something bigger, I could also hear the air leaving the mouth of whatever was whistling. Just an odd experience and I wanted to share. I stupidly went out for a brief walk along the trail running parallel to the Sugar River race in search of some sticks and or dead or dried up plants for an art project. It was around 8.30 pm and I really didn't think anything of it. I knew I'd be quick, it being winter and only 28 degrees, and even left my car running, anticipating I'd only be 5 minutes at most. I started down the trail with my headphones on and about 20 seconds into the walk I noticed something out of the corner of my eye. I took my headphones off and just as I did I heard something in the shrubs to my right. The branches were moving and creaking, and I heard the sound of ice melting and cracking beneath the brush. That's when I felt a little uneasy. I remember thinking oh wow there's more going on out here than I realized having my headphones on. So I kept walking and quickly dismissed my uneasiness as simply having heightened senses in an unusual environment at night. I continued down the path but didn't get far before realizing there was something in the middle of the trail about 40 feet in front of me. It took me about 5 seconds to make out its silhouette, large, crouched on all fours, and a human-like head that was positioned in such an odd way in comparison to its body that I knew with confidence it wasn't another human being. It didn't move, and although I couldn't see any of its features, I knew it was staring right at me. My heart dropped and I instinctively turned around and hauled ass back to my car. Once back in my car, I reversed and repositioned myself so that the headlights were shining down the path. Whatever it was had disappeared. I even turned on my brights and mustered up the courage to walk back down the path little ways just to prove to myself that whatever it was might still be there, i.e., a giant pile of sticks or brush, thinking my imagination got the better of me. No luck. There was nothing. I'm pretty damn sure of what I saw, and after doing some research I'm not convinced at all that it was your typical nocturnal southern Wisconsin animal. I've never seen or come into contact with a crawler, but I knew in my gut that something wasn't quite right about this creature. Edit, I couldn't shake the feeling of needing to go back to the trail after work, so I did. It was a lot colder tonight than it was last night, and the wind was catching the top layer of snow and blowing it around when I parked my car on the side of the road. I positioned myself so that the headlights were shining down the path, the same way I did yesterday after the encounter. I sat in the car for about three or four, long, minutes, just staring straight ahead and taking note of anything that moved. The wind kicking up the snow made the trail seem a little eerier than it was last night, the fog didn't help either. I didn't notice anything out of the ordinary. The plants and shrubs were blowing in the wind like one would expect. I finally decided to step out of the car. I was wearing only a sweatshirt and I had no interest in even shutting the car door behind me because it was freezing. I started to feel uneasy within seconds of being outside. I heard something in the brush to my right, and that was enough to make me think okay, you're acting ridiculous because it's probably just an animal, but at the same time, let's wrap this up. LOL. 
I had my phone in my hand and took a few pics before getting back in the car. My intention for doing so was just to show you guys what the trail looks like and nothing more. I knew there was nothing out there because I had been staring at the path for the last 5 minutes. Anyways, I got home and looked at the pictures. I took about a dozen, and nearly all of them were blurry because it's night time. The only two pics that weren't blurry have what looks to me like a person with an abnormally big head and something else with black eyes and a gapping mouth in the background. I was strongly debating even sharing these because I know how easy it is to find things if you're looking for something. I feel like an imposter for suggesting there may have been something out there that I didn't see when I was taking the pictures. But I really don't like the fact that I heard something in the brush on my right again. And then come to find out the picture has some creepy distortion going on where I heard the noise. All this to say, it's super, super likely that my imagination is just running wild at this point, but I can't help pointing out the two things that are playing tricks on my eyes. We were young kids between the ages of 13 and 16. We lived in a two and a half story house. We were in our room on the third floor when our black lab came flying up the stairs barking to get out attention. The dog ran straight down to the basement where we found our bulkhead door had been forced open. Believing this could be a possible burglary, we headed upstairs toward the main apartment on the second floor to call police. My older brother lived on the first floor with his wife and kids and was not home at the time. As we were coming up the basement stairs, we heard something moving hurriedly in the first floor hallway above. Once we got to the first floor, we noticed the door to the back porch open which is generally always closed. The bulb on the porch unfortunately was removed or blown, I can't really remember which. When we went out onto the porch, we saw a dark, black or green, entity crouched against the railing of the porch. At that crouched height it was about 4 to 5 feet tall. It had red glowing eyes. It sprinted over the railing and headed towards the woods about 300 feet from the house. This made its height roughly 6 to 8 feet. We ran into the house and called police, who after searching the house and neighborhood believed it may have been an adult human who attempted a break-in slash mess with us. And called our parents as well as telling us to remain indoors with the food locked. This was no human. I remember it as if it was yesterday. I don't even know if this the right place to report this as I don't know if this was a cryptid, or alien entity. No UFO of any type was spotted leaving the area. But I know damn well it wasn't human. So this was back when I was a freshman at Quinnipiac University in Hamden, Connecticut. Me and my buddies used to go into the woods behind the campus to smoke weed all the time. One night a bunch of us were doing just that, when on our way back to campus just myself and one other friend saw something darting through the woods. My memory is a little fuzzy because it was so long ago but we both still talk about it to this day, when I recently found this subreddit. What we saw was a very tall, slim, pale gray figure running faster than any human can. We were both bugged out, also high, but we know what we saw. The main difference between a lot of these other sightings is that it was not on all fours, it was running on two legs. I'll never forget the night of August 14, 2021. I was fishing the river with my friend in a suburb of Minneapolis slash St. Paul, Minnesota. We loved coming to this public park to fish because it was quiet and there was a nice sand bar to fish from. This park had a Sioux burial mound about a half mile from our spot. After fishing for a better part of the day, we decided to leave at dusk. In order to get back to our vehicles we had to take a trail through the woods, which was about a 5 minute walk. I put a clip on light on the bill of my hat so we could see the trail. I remember when I first glanced ahead down the trail I saw two circular white lights that I assumed were fireflies. Once we got further down the trail, we were closer to the area where I had seen the fireflies. 
It was then that I saw a pair of eyes that were either highly reflective from my light or glowing white. It wasn't long before I could make out a body. It was a very large white body on four legs, bigger than a wolf but unnaturally skinny. I couldn't make out any facial features because its eyes were so bright. I wanted to warn my friend but all I could manage to say was there's something there. We had no choice but to proceed because this was the only way back to our vehicles. This thing just stared us down but didn't make a sound. My friend yelled at it to try and scare it away, but it didn't react at all. I yelled at it after she did and it responded back mimicking my voice. I honestly questioned myself and thought I was imagining things. So I yelled at it again and it responded back at the same volume, same pitch, exactly like my voice. At this point we realized this was not an animal. We both continued on the path in silence but I maintained eye contact with the creature. I felt like this thing was ready to attack us at any moment but it just stood there staring. Eventually, we were out of the woods and I could no longer see its eyes. We made it back to our vehicles and felt a sense of relief. I asked my friend did you hear that talk back to me? She said she did and it sounded like my voice when it responded back to us. If she hadn't heard the voice I would have assumed I imagined it. We went over what happened and our stories were the same except she said the creature had a wolf-like head. After our experience, my friend who was Hmong went to see a shaman. The shaman believed it was an evil spirit and performed a cleansing on her. She was still shaken up by the experience for several weeks. I tried to hire a spiritual advisor online but when I described the experience and asked for a spiritual cleansing of my own it said they were not available at this time. At the advice of one of my friends, I burned some tobacco and said a prayer that the entity would leave me alone. It took me several months to just feel normal again, but I still think about it on a weekly basis. I tried to do further research and contacted the management at the park. They said the park we went to had ancient Indian remains scattered along the river that were unmarked. They said there were more Indian remains in that park than any other parks they managed. I contacted several Native American friends and was told the entity we encountered was a skinwalker. I know skinwalkers are part of the Navajo culture but from what I read it checks more of the boxes more than any other supernatural being or cryptid. So my sister and I are definitely not the only ones who saw skin crawlers last night. While at work today, I was still trying to recollect my thoughts on what had happened and where I work, there's this group of older people that sit at this table every day and drink coffee. Well, I was cleaning the counter where the fountain drinks are and I overheard one of them telling the others about a giant creature alongside the road that they saw last night. I don't know them that well but I decided to ask them for a bit of a better description. And he gave a damn perfect description of what I saw. Then I told him about what I saw in him and I told each other that we just thought we were crazy. But apparently we're not. This is becoming absolutely insane and honestly I'm kinda getting scared. It was January 2017. I was living at home in northern Minnesota. My parents started being more strict on me as I was a recent high school graduate and when I would come home the door was usually locked. On nights like this I would sleep in my truck. On this particular night it was about minus 17 F and I was a little worried about freezing up after shutting off the truck. So, I texted my friend Jay to see if he wanted to tag along. Jay and I took off driving around in the night until after 12 midnight when we decided to drive up to the base of a local mountain and park the truck for the night. I quickly nodded off, but awoke to Jay nudging my shoulder about 20 minutes later saying he felt like we weren't alone and felt watched. I was too tired at first and told him we would be alright, but he was persistent. I relented, so I drove towards town and by now the time was close to 1am. I found a turn off the highway after driving for about a mile and decided to park on a narrow trail that had been snowed in. I drove about halfway down the snowed in trail before I decided the snow would be too deep. We then parked, shut off the truck and closed our eyes. 
My eyes had been closed for about five minutes, but now, I had the feeling we were being watched. Not sure if Jay had been asleep, I decided to open my eyes to check, but what I saw instead was horrifying. As I looked through the front windshield I could see a giant humanoid prowling in the bush line about 50 feet from the parked truck. It was coming closer and my eyes were stuck to it. It got closer and now I could see it through the passenger window. It felt like it knew I was looking its way, as it was creeping up to the truck. I could tell Jay was watching by now, as he was also frozen with fear. The thing disappeared from view creeping towards the rear of the vehicle on the passenger side. We were both still in our seats and hadn't said a word. I even stopped breathing for a bit, I'm sure. Suddenly, the rear suspension began to lower as this being climbed into the truck bed ever so slowly. I could see Jay watching it but I was so terrified I couldn't look. The humanoid was over 9 feet tall. I was driving a Chevy Silverado. So the thing sat down like it was climbing onto a bench seat. As it sat it began to hunch over and then lower its head into view through the back window. It had big, yellow bloodshot eyes and its skin was dark, almost black, with a small mouth and small nose. It peered in, then Jay freaked out. It quickly jumped from the bed, leaving the truck shaking. For some reason, when it jumped off, my truck lights flashed three times, each flash brighter than the last. Jay was screaming, go, go, go. I tried to start my truck, but it wouldn't turn over. I turned the key back and forth multiple times with no success. But it eventually started. I never did figure out why the ignition failed to turn over. I hauled ass about 100 yards down the trail until I realized I wouldn't be able to turn around in the snow. I stopped and shifted into reverse. When I looked to back up I noticed my spotlight was in the back seat, so I told Jay I was going to look for whatever jumped out of my truck. He was quite reluctant, but I didn't care. I had to see it again. I parked the truck and began scanning the bush line towards where we saw it flee. I caught a glimpse of it as I was scanning from left to right. At first I only saw its lower half and passed it then Jay said, did you see that? I slowly returned the light back to the creature and examined it from bottom to top. It was so horrible. The claws hung at the lower leg area even with the creature erect. The fingers were about a foot long. It was skinny and looked malnourished and decrepit. I looked at the crotch and it had nothing there. It was just smooth. Its chest and abdomen looked elongated and very muscular, but skinny and long. I then brought the light to its face and that's when my heart dropped. It was looking at my eyes even with a spotlight to the face. It smiled from the small mouth, only to show a bigger mouth with sharp, crooked teeth. It then backed up while facing us and disappeared. Hey. So last night I was bringing my sister's boyfriend home and the three of us were listening to some Led Zeppelin on the radio and on the side of the road I saw what looked like a hairless giant creature with a deformed face and at first I thought that I was just imagining things but I was still freaked out so I still made a post asking what I could have possibly saw. After making that post on my sister and I's way home, we saw more. First it was my sister seeing one and telling me to speed up and I asked her what she saw. She gave a description that matched what I saw earlier. Then where I saw the last one I saw what looked like a gigantic creature instantly sprint across the road and it was just right behind where I could see with my brights one so all we saw was an outline. At first I thought I was still imagining things but then my sister asked me what that was and so I started freaking out even more to the point where I started speeding up to get the hell out of there. After driving even longer we saw one behind a sign that did nothing. Then after that we saw another one behind another sign and this time it stepped onto road immediately after we passed it and started following her and I for like 2 seconds before it vanished. This all took place along the road going from Crofton, Nebraska to Ponca, Nebraska. But we saw it more closer to Ponca. All that I know about the area, we're still kinda new to the area, is that long long ago it was inhabited by the Ponca Native American tribe. At the time of events it was around 10 at night. 
The best way to put on how I felt afterwards was terrified. Could they possibly be skinwalkers? Campsite Crawler Now, this happened to me when I was 7 in 2014. The only reason I can even remember this story is because my dad told me that our private property campsite was bought by someone recently. Me and my dad are avid outdoorsmen. We go hunting for squirrels, deer, pheasants, turkey, etc. We were at camp, sighting in our gun since it was getting close to deer season. When you would get to the gravel driveway to our camp, there were two sides to the driveway. On the right side, there was a small pond we would stock with trout and where our camper was. On the left was a big field with a line of thick pine trees, that will be of more relevance later. It was dark out and he told me to get in the truck, so I did. We had a black four-door Nissan Titan. I got on the passenger side with the spotlight. We had it headed towards the exit, so the field was off to the right. I was messing around with the spotlight, shining it at things, as you do as a kid. When I shined it across the line of trees, that's when I saw it. It was pale, with really disproportionate limbs. I could even slightly see its rib cage. It was hunched over something, so it must have been eating. I kept my light on it until my dad got over, when I took the light off of it. I tried to show it to my dad, but it was gone. He still doesn't believe me to this day. I might have seen two crawlers tonight. I work on a horse farm, and tonight while I was feeding my horse I noticed that they were all spooking at something on the other side of the farm. My boyfriend kept saying there was a person on the other side of the farm, I thought he was seeing a tree that looked like a person until he pointed at where it was and it looked like a unnecessary tall person. It started to move, I still thought it was a tree until we got to that side and the donkeys that were put over there because of coyotes were acting scare and they aren't normally scared. That's when I heard something in the wood and we pointed the headlight over then and my boyfriend grabbed a shotgun cause we both thought it was a person. It sounded like it was running away so I wasn't as concerned anymore until we saw one on the property next to the farm and it wasn't a person. There is no way it was a person but that's not what scared the both of us. The most it was when I was closing the gate and locking up. Whatever was out there started running at me and I ran to the car and when we got to the main road it stopped chasing us and we looked back and it was roughly 8 feet tall and just standing in the middle of the road. I don't know what I saw but I do know it wasn't a person. I don't know if what I saw was a crawler but I would like to know if it was and if they are going to cause issues out at the farm. Update, they are back tonight, will shooting them make them mad or kill them? Another update, my boyfriend got the main gate this time to see if it would chase him or if it was just going to chase me and it chased him and chased the car down the road for a little bit. Probably should mention that he was cussing at it and probably made it mad. I have looked at some of the other stories and pictures on this subreddit and I'm pretty sure that this is what we are dealing with. I'm going to try and figure out to link a video of the screaming we caught on camera tonight. What did my kid see? Any input is appreciated. This is my kid's story but I'm inclined to believe him. I just don't know what to make of it either. We live in a rural area slash dead end road. We walk it daily so we're very familiar with the scenery and the neighbor's habits. He likes to look at the stars so he went out for his last walk around 9 p.m. Came in out of breath, I thought maybe he heard coyotes and they spooked him. He said walking past a group of trees he thought he saw movement so he shined a flashlight that way and saw a gray face peeking at him from behind one of the trees. After googling, he showed me a picture of a rake and said it looked similar, but smaller eyes that reflected green. He thought at first it was a deer, but he couldn't see the rest of the body as he walked and it didn't move, just kept watching. He said he walked as calmly as he could and watched it from the corner of his eye for as long as he could see it discreetly, and as soon as he got to our immediate neighbor's house he ran. I wanted to call it a deer, but those trees have no tall brush around them, 
and three to four feet or so between each tree you could easily tell if a deer was standing there. And the group of trees are roughly 10 yards from the road, so near enough to see clearly given the heavy duty flashlight he takes. We went out tonight to see if we could see it, but nothing. Not that I wanted to, but he insisted. He needed to stumble upon it again with a witness for validation, I'm more live and let live, you stay out there and I'll stay in here. But it's really bothering him and things have been strange around here lately. So, any ideas? Need help with identification and what the hell that was last night. Okay for starters I did not believe any of this was real until after midnight last night. I believed everyone was just making things up and having communities like this to be a part of giggles. However, last night I saw something I could not and still cannot explain. I live in Newton, Georgia. My house is very rural and surrounded by woods on all sides, and all farms on my side of town. I did not know much about flesh pedestrians other than the mainstream stuff going around. Did not believe it was real. Mess with my girlfriend about it all the time to scare her as jokes. Frequently mention their actual name. However, I got back to my house around 2 AM last night. I was on FaceTime with my girlfriend while I was driving home, however, upon arriving, and on around 80% battery I might add, my phone shut off and would not work. I didn't think anything of it. However, I get out of my truck and my dog started going crazy barking and growling loud. They only bark at people they don't know, as they are livestock guardians and don't pay animals they don't see as threats any mind. Anyways, while they are barking, I hear what sounds like fake barking close behind me. Almost like a person trying to sound like a dog bark, but if that person had never tried, and was just bad at it. It made my hair stand up because I had assumed it was a person in the woods behind me. I turn towards the sound and see nothing. The sound happens again and when I look into the direction I saw a creature I'll never forget. It was hunched on all fours. Gray human-ish face. Large dark black eyes that reflected bright when the light was shined on it. No mouth. Human-like body, but with patches of fur throughout. Fur not covering body. Do not know any more details because as soon as I looked it in the eyes, it bolted towards me. I jumped in my truck and bolted. No more chasing. I called my grandmother who lives through the woods to give me an extra set of eyes, so I know I am not crazy. She, who has always been adamant that nothing exists paranormally, said she had been worked up by my dogs barking through the woods in a very high-pitched scream that sounded human and animal-like. We sat in the driveway and half-heartedly looked through the woods in the direction of the sighting. We began to hear a grunting in a different point in the woods. Loud grunting kind of like a deer and rut. We turned to listen, and then it started behind us. Then, the scream she had heard before was changing directions around us when we would turn to hear it every time. Could not sleep after going inside. Locked all windows and doors. Heard a tapping and knocking on my bedroom for about an hour. After falling asleep, had reoccurring nightmares of that being watching me and hunting me from different places. Please help me ID. Sounds like a Navajo SW. But I live nowhere near their land, nor do I know any Navajo. I myself am part Cherokee and Creek, but only about 15%. Not native ritual land I am on that I know of. Please help. I have never been skittish. My girlfriend routinely has to tell me not to go look in the woods by myself after hearing sounds. But after these sounds and what I saw, I will no longer be going outside at night. Help me ID bat offer solutions for what I can do to get it to leave. Crawler Humanoid Creature Encounters so this takes place in the Sacramento, California area. It was about two years ago now. It was winter, night time, around 2 a.m. I had just gotten off work but wasn't ready to go home so I had pulled over on the side of the road before turning into my neighborhood. On this street, 
There's a suburban neighborhood to the right and fields and trees to the left. As I was sitting there, I saw a figure come out of the neighborhood a little less than a one quarter mile ahead of where I was parked, approximately where the neighborhood park is. It was hard to see from that distance, but it appeared tall, seven to eight feet, super skinny and bony, hunched over, with long arms. It sprinted across the road at a speed faster than I've ever seen a human go, I couldn't guess the speed, but it was fast enough to concern me. If it wasn't for its speed, I probably would have just assumed it was human and ignored it. But anyways, it disappeared into the fields. Something calm came over me, I don't know what it was but something was keeping me from panicking. I remember just feeling like okay, it is time to leave now and calmly driving home. It wasn't until a few months later that I realized I had seen that and that it wasn't normal. Flash forward to a week ago, a friend and I were at that same park doing some spells, we're witches. As it got later into the night, we both started to feel more and more unwelcome there. As I was finishing up my spell, we heard a inhuman guttural scream that sounded like it came from the area I saw that creature cross at. That's not particularly incriminating. But as soon as I heard the scream, its apparent location made me think of the creature. I didn't tell this to my friend as she is easily spooked, and I just tried to calmly finish up my spell, didn't want to let my fear get out of control when doing spell work. We finally finished up and packed up and started the trek back to the car. As we left, we faced a dark area with lots of bushes and trees across from the sidewalk we were taking to get to the car. As soon as I faced that dark spot, I had the feeling of looking at a face. I didn't literally see a face, but it was the feeling of seeing a face. And it didn't feel like a human face. It felt like something that understood what I was but didn't understand why I was there, and wasn't quite hostile but had the attitude of like get out of my home. Once again, I didn't tell my friend that I saw that, not until we got in the car. Ever since then, I have not been able to shake the feeling that that face belonged to the same creature I saw two years ago. What do y'all think? Also, similar story but not the same, last night I was driving in a wooded area near Sac, and I saw a tall burly figure in the woods with a white face. Not white as in Caucasian, white as in stark white. I thought it was wearing a green shirt but I only saw it for a split second. It gave me such a bad uneasy feeling that I started putting protection sigils on my windows. I told the guy I was with what I saw and he didn't tell me until later but he said he's heard rumors of people seeing white walkers in these woods that are described as tall and having white faces and black hair. I don't know if he meant skinwalkers or what, but that's what he said. I also felt like something was watching me in those woods later. Possible sighting in Auburn, Alabama. Unfortunately, this story may be rather short as I only got a glance at it. Additionally, this happened only about 20 minutes ago, so I'm still shaken up by it. Regardless, I'm a student at Auburn University. I was on the phone with someone venting about why business majors need to learn calculus. Since me and her kept talking, I decided to not go straight back to my apartment and instead drove down a county road while we kept conversing. The road is mostly surrounded by trees with some sparse houses and the occasional gas station or other business sprinkled along one side of the road. I knew I needed to get back to my apartment to keep studying. And so after four or so miles, I turned around and was headed back. A few minutes later, still driving down the same road, and in a stretch with some buildings with their lights onto my driver's side, I glanced at my passenger side mirror and saw a pale humanoid body leap out of a tree and land in the ditch to the right of my truck. It was rainy and dark, so I couldn't see entirely clearly, but there was enough illumination from a light on in a parking lot to make out human-like arms, legs and just how white its skin was. It looked like it was curled up in a ball as well, which doesn't make sense why it would do that while jumping, but I know I could make out the clear silhouette of arms, legs and I could tell that it was human-sized. 
I immediately pushed on the brakes to see if I could get a better look and I swear I saw the red brake light glinting off the white skin as it moved along the ditch the opposite direction from me and back towards the tree line. It was like I stopped thinking as what I just saw registered with me and the shock hit me. I looked in the mirror and my face was as pale as the thing's skin. The girl I was talking to had continued talking during all this, as she didn't have any idea that this happened, and I realized that I'd responded to the last few things she'd said with sure or other short responses like that. I thought about telling her what I saw but I decided against it as I didn't want to sound insane. I drove back to my apartment and told one of my roommates about it who also is interested in things like this. He believed me and we ended up joking about it a bit which calmed me down. Sorry that this isn't the most descriptive or best written post. I think I'm still shocked at what I saw but I wanted to see if y'all think there's any reasonable explanation or if it's what I think it is. What freaks me out even more is that I was on this subreddit earlier today, I've always been interested in stuff like this, and I stumbled across a comment where a guy said that his brother also had a possible sighting in Auburn as well. Please let me know what y'all think. I had this encounter about a year ago, but I started thinking about it quite a bit recently so I made an account just to post this so please do tell me your thoughts about this. I also wanted to add that while I don't fully dismiss the paranormal I don't really believe in ghosts, cryptids and such. This encounter didn't really change my mind about that. I had decided to go on a solo hiking trip for about two weeks, this would have been my second time doing something like this. The first two days of the hike were very average and relaxing, just a simple hike, but at night things got a little bit weird. I went to sleep at around 2100 hours or 2200 hours and nothing much happened until around 2 o'clock. I remember smelling a faint stench of rotting meat, it wasn't anything too crazy, but it was weird enough to somewhat wake me up. I tried to ignore it and go back to sleep, but then I started to notice that something was moving around my tent. I did think that because of the smell and the sounds that it could be some carnivorous animal that maybe stank of rotting meat for whatever reason. But since I was still half asleep I wanted to make sure it's not a bear or something so I opened my eyes to check around. Now just to note that during that night the moon was quite bright so it was possible to see quite well outside so when I opened my eyes I could see a vague, lanky humanoid shadow outside my tent. I didn't feel like I was in danger or anything. I did have a sidearm with me so even if it was some creep I didn't really feel threatened while holding a gun. After about a minute the guy left, and the smell also disappeared, but since it was a very creepy encounter I stayed awake for about an hour and after nothing else happened I went back to bed. The next day I had that weird feeling of being watched by something dangerous, but I don't know if it was because I was confident in my ability to protect myself or whatever, but I didn't feel like I was in any danger at all, I just felt creeped out. I didn't really enjoy that day all that much to be fully honest and because of that I set up camp a lot faster than I usually did, but didn't go to bed at my normal time since I didn't want someone sneaking up on me again. At around 1 o'clock I could smell that weird smell again so I gripped my gun a little bit tighter and tried to find the guy, but instead all I saw were just a pair of yellowish eyes in the distance. I stared at them for about 5 minutes and then they just vanished together with the smell. I didn't feel like I was being watched anymore during that night so after an hour I did decide to go to sleep. The next day the feeling of being watched was back, but again, I didn't feel as though I was in any danger at all but I decided that even though I felt that way I would still rather cut this trip short instead of actually getting into a situation where I am in danger so I started making my way back, though through a more roundabout path. Nothing really happened that night. The next day I suddenly could smell that rotten stench, it wasn't any stronger than before, but since I was in a a decently large clearing at that time and didn't see anyone or anything around me I did panic a little bit and started walking with a faster pace. I'm not exactly sure on how long I walked after that, but around midday the stench got stronger. Now I think that it's important to note that I don't have the best vision and I should wear glasses, 
but I don't most of the time so when I looked around me and saw a grey humanoid figure quite far away to my left I did panic, but by the time I put my glasses on it was gone. After that I really didn't feel like staying there for much longer so I started doing a slow run to get out of there faster. I had run quite a distance while feeling something following me, but then I ran into this strangely peaceful clearing where both the stench and the feeling of being watched stopped. It was a relatively small clearing with a few small boulders around, but the strange thing was that a man who was in his late 40s or maybe even early 50s was sitting on one of the boulders. He was wearing very plain dad clothes, definitely not something you would be wearing while hiking in the middle of nowhere, plus he had no gear anywhere near him. But the thing that I noticed first about that guy was his strangely bright green eyes. They weren't bright in the literal sense, but more like the kind of brightness you would see in the eyes of a child. After running for so long I was exhausted and the men noticed that and told me to sit down on one of the boulders and rest. I didn't even think about it and sat down. We talked for a while, mostly about hiking and nature and while talking he had this very friendly smile that made me feel at ease. When I had rested he offered to help me build my campsite in the clearing. He was very good at starting a fire. We shared a cup of tea and he told me that it was very nice talking to me, but he has to go now. He didn't really say why or where he has to go, but he just stood up and left. That night I didn't hear any noises other than a few birds and crickets. When I woke up the next day I felt very refreshed. I packed up and started to continue along the trail, I didn't feel like I was being watched or smelled that stench at all during the rest of my hike. Well then, this was the first time I've told the story in full detail. I usually say that some animal or whatever was following me since that way people would actually believe me, but I decided to actually write exactly what happened. I also wanted to apologize for the long post in my English. I'm not a native English speaker so please do correct me if I made any grammatical mistakes and please do share your thoughts on this. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.